Amen. Let's go. Matthew chapter 5, verses 23 through 24. It says, so if you're presenting a sacrifice at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember someone has something against you. Uh oh, I'm going to start over. So if you are presenting a sacrifice or giving an offering at the altar in the temple and you suddenly remember that someone has something against you. Verse 24. Leave your sacrifice there at the altar. Go, somebody type, somebody shout, go. And be reconciled to that person. Then come and offer your sacrifice to God. I'm going to see if I can catch somebody. First, we said, I quit complaining. Then I think we said, I quit comparing. Then we said, I quit <laughs> excuses. Last week, ooh. I quit lying. Today, I quit offense. You may be seated. I quit offense. And if you've ever been offended, just type, help me, pastor. Help me, pastor. Help me, pastor. Prior to this I Quit series, quitting has been teached or treated as something to be demonized when in fact it should be what? Weaponized. I've said it once and I'll say it again. I have lived long enough now to see the adverse effects of people not quitting soon enough. We were taught, and I've said it once and I'll say it again, that quitters never win and winners never quit. But I would like to suggest and argue with you that quitting can be a powerful tool if used with discernment and in God's timing. If Jesus was on the cross, and we all know he's all God and all man, had he not quit on the cross or gave up the ghost, we would still be a penal and penalized to sin. There is a power that comes with quitting. And I told you that our working definition of quitting at Rock City, and I will keep saying it until you know it like your social security number. Let me see if you can finish. To quit is to intentionally do less, less so God can do more. Somebody just shout more. more. Somebody say more. more. Somebody say more. more. This is where I firmly believe God desires for his people to be because throughout the Bible we see principles that we can take and make applicable to our everyday life that when God sees our ability to trust him now I want you to catch this because I said it once and I'll say it again it takes faith to quit it takes faith to be still and let the Lord fight your battles it takes faith to trust God when you cannot trace him. And what I'm trying to get you to realize is there are a series of things that I believe we can quit. And as we quit those things, God can begin to do more in our lives. We talked about the quitting, the power to quit excuses. I learned as I pledged and matriculated through Kappa Alpha Psi Phi Nu Pi that quitting uh, excuses are tools of incompetence built on monuments of nothing and those who use them seldom amount to anything. Excuses. Oh, at Rock City, we don't make excuses. We make adjustments. Man, I was tripping this morning, baby girl, because I'm, I'm exhausted, man. We, we did a praise in the park in, I think, South Carolina. Then we had to drive all the way back from South Carolina. And this morning, you know how you press snooze and you say, uh, I'm going to just give me five more minutes. Give me five one minute. I don't know how I slept through the whole snooze. And all of a sudden, lady going to sit there and look at me and say, you just look so peaceful. Did you not know I had to get up and go preach? Wake me up out my peace, woman. So I'm sitting there. I get up, jump in the shower, boom. Then I, I put my clothes on, and I called him. I said, how much time do I have before praise and worship? I said, Pastor, you got about 25 minutes. I'm on the freeway zooming 100 miles an hour. All my YouTube members, you might have saw me in the comments, like, y'all pray for traveler's grace and arrival's mercy. And there was no way I would make it on time. So we literally could have said, well, since I'm not going to be here, somebody else just preach, I'll just stay home, but we don't make it excuses we make. Yes. Pastor Hollis and Pastor Darius, boom, go to the back. They zoom out of praise and worship, throw some chairs up here, begin to discuss the lesson. Once they get the green light, I'm here. They fade back to the news because I want to submit to you, you may be one adjustment away from destiny. 
One adjustment away from destiny. One adjustment. David is standing on the battlefield, looking across the field. He sees Goliath. Saul gives him his sword, his armor. David says, I thank you, but I need an adjustment. This sword is not fit for where God is calling to me to be. So if I just use what I have available from heaven, I will be able to be successful. I quit excuses. I quit complaining. I quit lying and being unhappy. But today I want to talk about I quit offense. Now do me a favor. Put this in your notes and I want you to take really, really good notes. Put offense. And then also just put outside of that offended. Same thing. Offense offended. Okay? I didn't want to say I quit offended. So, so offense offended, okay? One of the biggest silent killers of families, friendships, partnerships, and marriages is offense. Here's a beautiful quote for you. Being offended is inevitable. Living offended is a choice. Being offended is inevitable. Living offended is a choice. I want to say some hard things. This is a transformational series. And hey, Miss Jimmy, so good to see you back there. This is a transformational series, and it would be somewhat thought-provoking. It may not be a lot of shouting and a lot of hallelujahs, but I really want to grow you. Somebody say, grow me. In this life, you will be offended. The question is not if you will be offended. It is what will you do with the offense? And most people miss God because you're too busy dealing with the offense. And I would like to suggest to you that today, and I want you to write this in your notes. So if you want to put it on Instagram, put it on Instagram. If you're watching online, you want to go ahead and pull your cell phone out and record this statement so you can bless your timeline, bless your families. Somebody say, I quit offense. And I would like to challenge all of you watching me today, I would like to challenge you to put down the magnifying glass and pick up a mirror. Yeah. I would like to challenge you to put down the magnifying glass and pick up a mirror. Make that make sense. Many of us use a magnifying glass because we're so busy pointing out the flaws in others. When God wants you to deal with the flaws that you have in yourself. We have mastered examining them and we have failed examining our own hearts. This is why one scripture says you're so busy trying to get a speck out of your neighbor's eye when you have a beam. Who am I talking to here? In your eye. And isn't it crazy that some of the people who end up the most offended do the most offending? I don't think nobody heard me. Have you ever met somebody with the nastiest attitude but can't take nothing? Who got a comment and a joke for everybody, but the moment you don't call them back, they're in their feelings. Why, PMJ? Because oftentimes the offended master offense, which is why they recognize offense because they practice offense. Michael, hear me when I say this. Being offended is inevitable. What you do with it matters. Is that not critical? Is that not critical? Is that not critical? Why, Pastor Mike? Because I want to challenge you, in fact, that the goal of the enemy is destruction. Now, I want to say this, and I'm going to say it slow enough for you to put this in your notes. Are you ready? All right, put this in your notes, and somebody put it in the comment section so we can pin it so nobody will miss it. The goal of the enemy is destruction. Okay? The strategy is division. And his weapon of choice is offense. That was rich. The goal of the enemy is destruction. The enemy comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I came that you may have life. Okay? So watch this. The enemy's goal is destruction. His strategy is division. A house divided cannot stand. Abraham Lincoln didn't say that. Jesus said that. 
A house divided cannot stand. So what's the goal of the devil? The goal of the devil is to destroy. So do me a favor. I want you to put it in your notes like this. And again, for the third week, I'm live. So I can't give you my creative things on screen because once again, Dre has not mastered the ability to flow on the spot. I don't know what I pay him to do all week. He puts nice little clips together, but for some reason, he cannot put it on the spot. Part of me want to say, Dre put it on the spot right now just to see what he would create if I asked him to do it, but I don't know if he can do it. So let's just say Dre could or he had enough faith to at least attempt to do it. So what we would do is we would put goal on the screen, okay? So I want you to put on your notes, the goal is equals destruction. Devil's goal equals destruction. I would, I would pay any amount of money to go to the back and see what Dre is trying to conjure up <laughs> right now. The goal is destruction, okay? The strategy, upon a strategy, is division, weapon, offense, okay? Okay? Help me, Holy Ghost. I really hope you catch this picture and this analogy, okay? So at the top, you have the goal equals what? Destruction, put a line outside of that because you're not really sure what he's trying to destroy yet. All right, can I free you real quickly? Can I free you? All right, so the devil's trying to destroy my life. That's too broad. That's too broad because if the devil took my money, it wouldn't hurt me because money doesn't matter to me like that. I've been broke. I've, 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 I know what it's like to live in an extended stay. I know what it's like to file bankruptcy. Making me broke won't hurt me. It might even motivate and inspire me more. I've never had nothing. I've always been creative with what I had. So, so for the devil to destroy my money wouldn't hurt me personally. It would hurt me corporately because I needed to do what God has called me to do. So the, the, the first thing you have to understand is, please put this in your notes. What is he trying to destroy? What is he trying to destroy? Life is equivalent to a pulse. The pulse is, in, in, is, in, is in act, inadequate without a heartbeat. So what is at the heart of your life that he's trying to destroy? So he, his, his goal is to destroy blank the marriage. He knows how hard you pull on each other and that's your lifeline and that's your backbone and that's your strength. So if he can destroy that, what will he do? His goal will be to destroy your marriage. The strategy he will use will be division. Division. Division, which comes from a Greek word where they substitute V's with F's. So in America, we say division, which is V, but in French, they said division, which was an F, force. So divorce it's really divorce, split force. When you come together, you bring something. When I come to the table, I bring something. And together, we'll force. But when he destroys the marriage by causing division, it splits the force. Maybe your prayer life at home isn't as strong as it should be because offense has been used to divide the force. What could y'all accomplish if y'all was praying together? Maybe the friendship isn't strong because the devil, he's coming. His goal is to destroy the friendship. Maybe his goal is to destroy your creativity. Maybe his goal is to destroy your finances. Maybe his goal is to destroy this church. And what will he use? His goal is to destroy destruction. His strategy is division. And the weapon he uses is offense. Oh, I wish somebody caught what I just said. And, 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 and it's hard. I want to say this right. It's hard to live happy when you are easily offended. It's hard to be satisfied when you are easily offended. It is hard to have peace when you are easily offended. Some of you don't need a prayer partner. You need a cut man. What's the cut, man? In boxing, I have somebody in my corner who does not talk, who does not coach, who does not come into agreement with anything. His only responsibility is if in this battle I get cut, stop the bleeding. 
Many of you have a trainer and a friend who gonna co-sign your foolishness. And many of you got prayer partners who gonna touch and agree with you. Your problem isn't the lack of power. It is you don't have anybody in your life maintaining the leaking. And when you live a life of offense, you will always be on defense. Why does the devil cause offense? All my fellas, give me a roof, roof. All my ladies, give me a yeah. yeah. Today during football, Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback ever because he's on offense. It is his job to score. But it, there is another group on the field called the what? Defense. defense. What's the job of the defense? To stop the offense if you only have offenders in your circle the devil will always score I need a couple defenders who will put me in a spiritual place that grow me to a point that I am not easily uh, offended this is why you're depressed sometimes you're so worried about the negativity that you don't even realize the beauty of what God is actually doing in your life 300 people can tell you I'm proud of you and you'll be up all night thinking about the one person who said you're not what you thought you was going to be. 500 comments on Facebook saying great job. And you'll look at the one comment saying I didn't like the song. Because it is hard. Am I helping anybody? To be happy when you live offended. And in fact, the enemy's goal is destruction. His strategy is division. It is the splitting of force. That's crazy. And what is the weapon he will use? And I want to make you aware of this in your life. The weapon he will use to destroy marriages, to break up strong friendships, to turn you against you, is offense. Jesus. And an offense, this is good today, is the act of becoming annoyed or resentful as a result of an actual or perceived insult, slight, or wrongdoing. That's what an offense is. What is an offense, Pastor Mike? I'm going to say it again. It is the act of becoming annoyed or resentful as the result of, listen to the definition, an actual or perceived insult, slight or wrongdoing. Now, I, I said a, a cold statement, Jill. I think everybody missed Derek. All right, I'm going to read it again. It is the act of being annoyed or insulted or becoming resentful of an actual or perceived I, 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 need to, I need to survey the room and online if I'm talking to you I want you to put hands up in the comments and give me crazy hearts right here how many of us have ever been offended from something we perceived even if it wasn't even reality perceived perceived faith comes by hearing and hearing by the what faith is the substance of things and the evidence so I, want, I want a toy. I just want it. This is just me. This is a thought-provoking series. I want to challenge your cognitive approach to how you view your life. Faith is the substance of things and the evidence of things. So to be seen is what? Reality. To not be seen is perception or imagination. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things sort of imagined. Which is why as a man thinketh in his heart, he becomes. See, perception is so strong that the moment you begin to nurse and rehearse, put, put that in your notes. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Y'all missed that. Many of us remain offended because we nurse and rehearse. We, we become offended. Y'all don't like me today. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. Most people remain in offense because they nurse and rehearse. So when you are insulted or perceive that you have been insulted or annoyed, you missed that phrase. It's so much teaching in this. I need a whole nother day, really, because most of us aren't even insulted. We are annoyed. Something aggravates you. Why is it aggravating you? And I'm going to say this and I pray three people can agree with your pastor or just grow from this statement. Half of the things that aggravate me aren't the things, I want to say it better, the, my reaction to what people did, 90% of the time ain't even about what they did. It's the spillover for what I never addressed. 
I'm going to say that again. So, so, so I'm going to be honest with you. If I snap on you, 90% of the time, what you did wasn't that deep. You catching it for the people I gave a pass to. Michael! Because I told you, you are either a stuffer or a spiller. Oh, my God. I'm getting into focus group now, ain't I? That's why you better focus group and struck back. You are either a stuffer or a spiller. Please put that in your notes. Am I a stuffer or a spiller? What's a stuffer? I just keep packing stuff in. Keep packing stuff in. Somebody hurt your feelings, you don't say nothing. Somebody say something wrong to you, you don't say nothing. Something else happened in your life, you never deal with it. You avoid conflict because you think avoidance is deliverance and you don't even realize it's still ruminating in the crevices of your mind and it's stacking and it's stacking and it's stacking and when you finally explode, everybody's looking at you like it wasn't that deep. It wasn't that deep. It was just that deep. You missed what I just said. That's a double entendre. See, what they did wasn't that deep. The pain was just that deep because you've been stuffing it. Oh, double stuffer. No. So now what I'm discovering is I have to stop nursing and rehearsing. Who's going to put that in the comments for your pastor today? Nursing and rehearsing. So now, now when you are offended or aggravated or irritated, you nurse and rehearse. Nurse. What does nursing mean, ladies? Nurture. What does nurturing mean? To feed, to take care of, to, to ensure that it grows healthy. See, nursing is the process in which you ensure that something grows healthy. You're not just allowing your offense to maintain. You're making sure it grows strong. You feed your offense. Yeah. So now, and the devil's so subtle. So now, when you're offended and you're walking in the spirit of offense, and I'm going to get to that in a minute, because I believe offending is more than emotional. I believe it's spiritual. So now when you're walking in the spirit of offense, now your eye is open. Your spirit is open to offended food. What's offended food? Post. That's always geared towards haters. Yeah. Yeah. Now, now your spirit is alert. Now you gravitate to other offended people. Now a person can give you healthy criticism and all you digest is the, criti is the offense. Well, 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 I love what you're doing. And if I were you, I would just go about it a little different, you know, because I know it's a lot of people who are doing so-and-so, 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 so but how you're going about it is kind of wrong and the people have been good to you and so-and-so, so-and-so. So then the next thing you say is that so-and-so said they understand because an offended heart always is attached to an offended ear. I'm talking heavy today. Y'all do not like me, and I'm going to grow by myself. Y'all ain't got to like me. I done messed around and let 50 y'all in the room. Now y'all mean mugging me. Like, you done let me in this church. I'm thinking I'm going to be high-fiving my neighbor. Now I'm sitting having to deal with my own issues, sitting there looking offended. I don't care. I don't care. I want you better, not bitter. Somebody should have said, I received that. And I want to say this again. How many people in this room online, I want to do a public poll. Raise your hand. Type your hand in the comment. Whatever it is, we are not going to let the devil maintain this stronghold in the dark areas of our life. I want to poll our ministry today. How many people have ever been offended? It's the whole room. Offended. I'll never forget. Man, I'll never forget it, man. I'll never forget uh, Big Drop and everybody's going crazy about Big. And I'm just trying to find ways to just kind of swag it out some more. And I'm over here. I go, on, I go on social media. I'm like, I don't do nothing small. Everything's big. Then I'll never forget one of my members came to me. I had no idea she had a blog entitled Big is the New Small. You know, so she hit me with Pastor Mike. It's hard enough having to fight people. Now, all of a sudden, my own pastor dogging out what I feel God has called me to be. And I promise I'm sitting there in my heart, and I'm like, like, when I never even knew you had a blog. But 21 million streams later, I still remember that one comment. Because offense takes root. And I want to be very clear, the closer they are to you, 
the greater the opportunity. The greater they, the, the closer they are to you, the greater the opportunity for anything, not just offense, for intimacy, for faith, but more intently, offense. I, I want to talk about this. Why? Because I, I want to submit, and my brother said this to me and it blessed my life. He literally said to me, and I hope you can receive this, he says, in order to overcome offense, we must learn to forgive. Can you put this in your notes? This is so cold-blooded. It takes one to forgive. It takes two to reconcile. This is why most of our offense remain. It takes one to forgive. It takes two to reconcile. So in your friendships, in your relationships, in ministry, in business, and in life, if you forgive them, but they don't do the work on their end to partner into the healing, you can forgive, but the offense is still rooted. I'm going to free you real quickly. Forgiveness cuts down the tree of offense. Reconciliation removes the root of offense. Jesus. Because let me free you. And I want you to just say amen. It's quiet in Zion, but I, I could feel you pulling on my spirit at home. And I want you to catch this. Have you ever forgiven somebody? Then six months later, went at them all over again because they did the same thing. And then all of a sudden, your whole argument started with, see, this ain't finna happen. Because although you cut down the tree, you never dug up. And most offense, most offense, and this was crazy, especially with those close to you, most offense comes in two forms, unrealistic expectations and unmet, I'm sorry, I want to say it better, unmet expectation and unexpressed expectations. That's cold. Normally I would say unrealistic, but I want to take the road less traveled today. Unmet expectations and unexpressed expectations. Oh my Lord. Oh my Lord, am I going too fast? This good, this good? Because a lot of times, I never get one of my members uh, told me, Pastor Mike, uh, I just don't feel a spiritual connection uh, to you as my pastor anymore. And I was like, oh my Lord, because I care. I'm like, so, so what can I do better? And I discovered what I had with that particular member was unexpressed expectations. She came from sort of a smaller church, her and her husband. So, so they got phone calls on birthdays. You know, on big events, they got invited to dinner with the pastor and they watched the pastor's children and they did all this stuff. And, and, and I told her, I said, I love you. I said, number one, that was never expressed to me. You know, so again, I'm going to show you growth. I repent that I didn't meet your unexpressed expectation. Pastor Mike, why would you repent for something they never told you? Because I was trying to give them reconciliation, not just forgiveness. Because if I operate in pride and say, well, you never told me that you've grown. You should have dealt with that on your own. I then destroy the soil for the next sower. See, I want you to be the type of ex that leave them better. Jesus. Pastor Mike, do you know what they did to me? No, God bless you. I'm going to prove to you. See, see, true health is not walking away to teach them a lesson. It's walking away because you learned your lesson. <laughs> When I walk away to teach them a lesson, I want to leave them broken so they can feel what I felt. When I walk away because I've learned my lesson, I walk away in such a way that I heal the parts that I broke. And I am no longer bound to the parts that you try to keep attached. Watch this. So I cut the cord because I really want to see you better, not broken. See, see, I hope you catch this. I hope you can receive it. See, the offended, the offended, Offended will always walk in another level of pride. Why, PMJ? Because to walk in offense is like building a wall, then penalizing people for not climbing over it. It's called unmet and unexpressed expectations. Did you catch that? Did you catch that, Aisha? Aisha, if you this close and you come to all the recordings and you have my number and you have direct access that if something's bothering you, all you can do is share it with me and you still get offended, you choose to be offended. Did you catch that? So what happens now? So now let's just say Aisha is close to me and let's just say Elder Carleen, uh, Evangelist Carleen, birthday was last Thursday. So I, I'm sitting at home, don't have anything to do. 
And for once, I open Facebook, and I see everybody say, happy birthday, Carlene. So then what do I do? I go on Carlene's face and say, oh, happy birthday, Carlene. Then the next day is your birthday. But I got six interviews. The boys got football, so-and-so, so-and-so. I never go on social media. You never told me your birthday. Unexpressed. I didn't see it was your birthday. All right? So then you go home that night and say, man, he told Carlene happy birthday and never told me. That's, and what? She's now in an offense. All right, she has a legitimate reason as to why she's offended. Watch this. Every person has a right to be offended. I also believe you have to have a due diligence to investigate the offense. Did you catch that? You should have a diligence to investigate the events, okay? So, so especially if there's relationship. Ooh, I'm going there today. So now Aisha has a responsibility to now say, man, Pastor, and tell me happy birthday. Like, man, he told Carlene, so and so, do, 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 do. Hey, 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 Pastor Darius, did Pastor know it was my birthday? Well, I'm not sure if he knew it was your birthday. I'm so sorry. Um, let, me, let me hit him up and try to see if he knew it was your birthday. Boom, boom, do, do, do. Hey, Pastor Mike, did you know it was Aisha? Oh, my Lord. Yeah, she gave me a call. She might have been just a little bit offended. She grown. Ain't got time to be telling her no happy birthday. I'm busy. See, watch this, because now I'm offended that she's offended. Wow. Now I'm offended that she don't know a schedule I got that I never expressed to her. Wow. It's tennis. Yeah. It's tennis. Oh, if this was a recorded sermon, Dre could have really put a production for that right there. But he hasn't got to a point yet where he can produce live in the midst of church. Because if I could, Aisha had a legitimate offense. He didn't say happy birthday. Then over here, I could have been mature and just said, oh, my Lord, give me her number. But because I now feel like she should understand, because what do you do? I build my case. Yeah. Well, I told her happy birthday last year. I told her happy birthday the year before that. I just took her to, I just took her to the Mexican restaurant three days ago, and we ate. That was her pre-birthday dinner, if you really want to know the truth. And then all of a sudden now, I'm offended. She grown. Yeah. All right. So then all of a sudden, three days pass. And she's talked to Pastor. Now, I told Pastor D, and that's his brother. So I know he told him. Mm. Then now all of a sudden on Facebook, you see a pastor who's just probably trying to get likes and say, it's a shame when you're connected to a ministry where the shepherd does not know the sheep and he doesn't so-and-so, so-and-so. So now your offended ear and your offended heart, like, oh, my God. So now you share it. To throw us that, that now you share it because you offended. So now you got your little circle of four or five people. Like I can't believe he didn't tell you happy birthday. And they are nurturing. I'm preaching to somebody. I'm preaching to somebody. They are nurturing the offense. So now go to your timeline. It's all about well, if it's real, they'll tell you. Or if it was a real connection, it you should know so and so, so and so. Well, I want to be connected to a shepherd who smells like sheep. Yada 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 yada. And now you're connected to all of this hurt because you were using the offense subconsciously to nurture the pain that you could have dealt with intimately. So then now, Pastor looks at his thing and says, "Hey, so so now my team says, have you noticed so and so social media?" So then I look at the social media and I'm like, are they throwing shots? Are they throwing shots? So now since I'm in offense, I go post now. If you need a mama, you should ask your mama for birthday. See, I'm one of them people at me so, it's, no, it's, so you can know it's real. So now both of us broken, watch this, when in reality we love each other, but of the goal of the devil is destruction. His strategy is division. Watch this. So now the senior pastor can't even come into agreement with one of his prayer warriors because he used a weapon called and that same tactic is what he used in marriages. He didn't know he, he, didn't, he, didn't, he didn't know birthdays were a horrible experience for you growing up. You never said that. So when all he plans for you is a dinner and you had expectations of something grand, now you're in a fence. So now when his birthday comes around and he says to you, baby, I want to do a big for my birthday, your offense kicks in because you say now, yeah, well, no, we ain't do all that for my birthday. No, we ain't doing it because you offended. Y'all ain't got to like me. 
Y'all ain't got to like me. I, I'm talking heavy today. I'm talking heavy today. And Jesus taught this in, Je in Luke 17 and 1. It's what theologians call the in inevitability of offense. It is what theologians call the inevitability of offense, which means being offended is inevitable. Yeah. Being offended is inevitable. That's why I open the message by telling you, and I pray you receive it, being offended is inevitable. Living offended is a choice. Yeah. Wow. Look at Luke 17 and 1. Then he said to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come. Yeah. Did you catch what Jesus just said? It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. Jesus was simply telling them, quit offense. I'm pretty sure the, the numbers are low today, Leslie. Just pray for me. I'm so glad I'm not at home and I can't see them live. Oh, my Lord. I'm pretty sure everybody done logged off the sermon. Like, ain't nobody trying to hear this. Why PMJ? He tells them, and, then, and look at the text. I'm in Luke chapter 17, verse 1. He said to his disciples, he said to his disciples, it is impossible that no offense should come. It is the inevitability of offense. Here's the big idea. You want to put this in your notes? Offense can become offense that keeps you from getting out and others from getting in. I'm going to say it again. Offense can become a fence that keeps you from getting out and others from getting in. When you live in offense, it becomes offense. Therefore, you're so guarded you won't let nobody love you. Then you offend it that don't nobody love you. Michael, that's the power of offense. Offense is so strong that it makes you believe you got to protect you. Then blame people for not protecting you. Offense will make you get in a two-seater, then get mad when 10 people can't ride. Because you build the mode of transportation in your life through trust. Trust designs the vehicle you take in life. And what I'm trying to get you to realize is offense keeps you trapped in and it keeps others locked out. I want to ask a question and they told me there's over 2,000 people watching us right now from across the world. And I want to ask you a question right now. I really, really want to ask you a question to my, my, my new friend that I met today, uh, Chef Kia's brother, who's in the military right now. He's been watching our series for the last week, and I surprised FaceTimed him. Uh, this morning, she said, Pastor, my brother been watching church. That's a prayer me and my mother prayed before she passed. And uh, I said, give me his number. And I FaceTimed him, and he was literally at the Army barracks watching I Quit Complaining. And I'm FaceTiming him this morning. So, man, shout out, brother. Thanks for meeting me at church today. Here's the question I really want to ask you, and I want to ask this to everybody in this room right now. And I want you to be very transparent and very honest. And if you're watching online and you're bold enough to say, Pastor, you're talking to me, I want you to be transparent and bold as well, okay? Here it is, trapped in. Who actually wants more friends but the fence too strong? Oh, I... <laughs> Can I be honest? This whole, see, I don't do people. That's offense talking. To every woman watching right now, here's your offense language. I don't do females. When truth be told, you want some girlfriend. Who don't want some friends? Who? Who don't want a click? Y'all lying. That's why y'all watch Living Single. That's why y'all watch girlfriends, my girlfriend, there through thick and thin, girl, my girlfriend, because everybody wanted friends, friends. I want friends, but every time I let somebody close, they leave. Can I help you? I'm at a point now in my life where I realize all leaving ain't bad. Yeah. You know? My, my organ player, uh, shout out to Corey, um, when he was a junior in high school, we were having a campus at Centerpoint, and the Holy Spirit laid him on my heart. So all the way through high school, I even paid him some while he was in college, and when he came home, he was on staff. Recently, he's left our church to go play at another church, and I've never been more proud of him in my life. 
See, because in my organization, he played auxiliaries right there on Oregon. He's finally getting the opportunity now to sort of do what Rod's doing. He gets a chance to lead and develop. And if we can be completely honest, as long as Rod's sitting in that seat, there's no chance really for Corey to become what he's going to be. One man waters. One man plants. Another man waters, but it is God who gives the what? Increase. I've matured to a place. Now I say, hey, Corey, we don't have to fall out. Now no, no, tell me what you feel. I said, no, I'm sort of like a father to you. I said, I ain't never been more proud of you in my life. No, when I met you, it was in 11th grade. Now you're grown. You got a girl you love. You're thinking about family. You want to grow your sound. I said, baby boy, go do that. I'm going to be standing right here. And see, here's what's wrong. When your child leaves high school, you proudly send them away because you plan on them coming back. But when people need a college season from you, no, I'm not offended. I'm proud. I'm proud. I'm proud now because when I see this church he's at go to another level, then all of a sudden the music department starts growing and he starts introducing stems and then production. Then when he calls back over and says, Pastor, we're trying to get something mixed real quick. Who can I call? I'm going to be proud of that. I get credit in heaven for that. I'm going to be proud. But many of you keep everything and everybody locked out because you're offended. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. That's Proverbs 18 and 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city. And their contentions are like the bars of a castle. That's Proverbs right there. That's Proverbs right there. Pastor Mike, why is that so important? And I need you to catch this now because I don't look at offense as just an emotional reaction to someone's opinion or action. I think it goes far deeper into an issue of our flesh and a demonic realm. The spirit of offense causes division. The biggest key element that offense does is break up unity. It loves to conquer and divide. And we see this in Proverbs 18 and 19. A brother offended is harder to be won than a what? Strong city. And it talks about contention. So what's contention, Pastor Mike? Contention is to have a heated argument. It puts bars and gaps between you and that person. So contention is a heated argument. And what does it do? It puts bars... And guess, D-Mac, D-Mac, come, come in for a quick second. So, so God desires that we walk like this. God desires for your marriage to be unified, your friendships to be unified, your church to be unified. I'm going to go deeper. You and your children to be unified. You and your in-laws to be unified. Watch this. So what happens is he pulls on subtleties. Like, let's just take, for instance, in-laws. I'm a McClure, you're a Johnson. So the devil will pull on the name. Well, they're not a Johnson. Anything so offense can come. So when there's contention and we have a heated argument, heated fellowship, a heated argument. I say something, you say something. Because you know what an argument is? It's a case. An argument is a legal document. That's all it is. An argument is a legal document document okay so here's my argument boom you smack your argument boom it's sort of like when black people pay, play spades you know boom then you slap your argument boom then you slap your argument boom then you slap your argument boom and then then what happens is it puts gaps i ain't like what you said anyway boom then he says something so, no, no, no. boom well i can't stand so 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 dumb. boom let, let me free you let me free you what's the proof of an argument volume Volume, because the more space, the louder it becomes. And the more space, and the more space, all right? Th this is why, this is why if I offend you and some space come, bro, I'm sorry, man. You can reach for me. We can pull it back together. I offend you, man, I, I ain't mean it. And we can pull it back together. Many of your relationships can't be reconciled. You've allowed too much space. Stay right there for me, Dre. If you can zoom out, camera one, I want to stay right there. 
What color's behind me? Blue. What color's behind him? And space has put us in two different atmospheres, two different environments, two different time zones, two different spaces in life. So let me show you what happens at this point when there's a fence. One of you get to a point where you're ready to reconcile. Or I'm sorry, you're ready to forgive. And when you forgive, you stay offended. You come back to the point. But there's nobody there. And because there's nobody there, you reoffend. So then he wants to forgive. But now you're like, no, nah, I, I tried to let it go six months ago. I ain't going to keep playing your game because you offended. And he goes back. And for many of you, this is what your life looked like. And you look up, and seven years done passed. The most miserable I have ever been in my life was the season when me and my brother was at odds. That's public. The most miserable, because we let a fence get in. I wasn't mature enough. It's so much I could have done better. That was the worst part of my life. And here's the crazy part. Then we got cool, but God never called us to be cool at a distance. Because can I ask you a question? When, you, when you're designed to do this, but then you live like this, it don't feel the same. That's some of the most miserable times of my life. Miserable times of my life. And my team would tell you, we would be winning, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I'd look over and be like, I want to do a detour. So I let a fence come in. I let a fence. And contention puts gaps can I ask you a question? Who's going to build a bridge? Who's going to build the bridge? Can I ask you a deeper question? Are the people in your life helping with the bridge or building more gaps? <laughs> Thank you, D. Because there are some people who like you better offended because they get more from you. I got to stop, man. Y'all not going to like me today. Y'all not going to like me today. And at the root, do I need to stop or keep going? Can I keep going? Shall I proceed? Yes, indeed. Hear me when I say this. Unforgiveness at the root of offense is unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness occurs when we refuse to give others what God has already given us. It's unforgiveness. Unforgiveness. Unforgiveness occurs when we refuse to give others what God has already given us. A forgiving person has no past and an unforgiving person has no future. That's a cold statement. A forgiving person has no past. He's let go of yesterday. The, the, the track record is clean. That's if I really forgive you. To forgive is to release the offense. to release the offense. But an unforgiving person has no future. I refuse to move past this. Stuck. An offended person will always live in yesterday. This is why, oh, that was heavy. An offended person will always live in yesterday. Why, Pastor Mike? I hope you catch this. This is why if they come back, you should even be shouting till you discover if they still offended. If I got to walk on eggshells with you when you come back, that's proof you still offended. Well, I want to say that because you know how it was last time. Both of y'all hold on to the offense. Either we better or we ain't. Oh my God, y'all don't like me today because I offended you. Because the gospel is offensive. Dark don't like light. Bland don't like salt. God says you are the light of the earth. You are walking offense to the enemy. This is why the attack on your life is so strong. The attack on your life is so strong because the devil knows you keep offending him. He put all that hell in your life and expected you to be depressed. And you said, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Yeah. 
I'm going to say something and only seven people going to catch this. Hell is mad because hell is offended. It took your whole bloodline out but can't do nothing with you. It's offended. It put all that drama on your doorstep, but you still woke up and said, God, I thank you for every mountain you brought me over and every valley you took me through. I am on this earth to make hell not just mad, but offended. And if you ever, if you don't hear a message from your man of God every now and again that offends you, go to another church. Because true gospel and the true preaching of the gospel comforts the afflicted and afflicts the comfortable. There should be a message that comforts you when you're wounded. But then there should also be a message that offends you when you're comfortable. Normally we refuse to forgive others because, and I, I got to stop, I've been too long today. Here's why we for, refuse to forgive. Let's go quickly. Number one, we let our pride decide. Give me 12 minutes on the clock and, and I'm going to stop. We let our pride decide. Here's why we don't forgive. When we withhold forgiveness from someone else, we are saying, I deserve forgiveness, but they don't. Yeah. I deserve forgiveness, but they don't. Wow. We are attributing our own behavior to our circumstances while attributing someone else's actions to their character. See, when you are offended and it's impossible for you to give because you're offended and you're walking in pride, what you're saying subconsciously is you should offer forgiveness to me because of the circumstances, but I'm not going to forgive you because that's your character. Yeah. I had to tell somebody about three months ago uh, who used to walk in ministry with me. I, I said, just don't ever come back. And I, asked, I said, just don't ever come back. I said, because I'm going to be very clear with you. I'm not going to live to try to meet your expectations. I made, I made it very clear. I'm not going to live to meet your expectations. And I said, and it is arrogance to think you could leave and get better, but then left me here and I stayed the same. That's what people will do to you. They judge themselves off the circumstance. They judge you off your character. So they tell you things like, well, the reason I cussed you out is because. But then the reason you cussed them out is because you ain't nothing. No, I said what I said because of what was going on. You said what you said because that's how you really felt. That's pride. That is pride. That is pride. Here, here it is. Here it is. I'm going to show you how offense sets in and how offense manipulates scripture. Okay, Jesus left the 99 to go get the one. What was the one? A sheep, not a goat. He went and got the sheep because the sheep was in pure ignorance. It didn't know better. Or in other words, it was distracted. A sheep is the type of animal that can be walking in a pack and here in the bushes, shh, look and go investigate it. And before the sheep realizes it, it's alone and away from the pack. So the shepherd, watch this, would trust the 99 to keep each other. Because the 99 didn't move if he didn't move. So he would leave the 99 because they could self-police. He would go into the woods and find the one. But here's the part that you don't realize. Because all you hear is, come get me. He would then break the sheep's leg. As a reminder, don't ever walk away again. And many of us will never be whole because we won't stand still long enough for somebody to break us. Every now and again, a true leader has to break something. There are certain scenes in my life where God had to break me. Okay, so you really think this you. Oh, you really think you that nice? <laughs> Don't go over there again. An offense will start making you tell or make scripture to fit your emotion. <laughs> Number two, we don't forgive because we assume we already have. Did you catch that? Number one, we don't forgive because of pride. Number two, we don't forgive because we assume we already have. One of the biggest misconceptions about forgiveness is that it is an event when in actuality it's a process. Saying I'm sorry is step one. 
Can you put this in your notes? Forgiveness, or, I'm sorry, type forgive. Then under forgive, Sarah Wright, repent. Forgiveness is that which you say or offer. Repentance is that which you do. Repentance is a change of actions. I'm, gonna, I'm going to forgive you today and let my life show you I repented. Most of you never get reconciliation because you were so happy about what was said that you were crushed by what was lived. So they said, I'm sorry. And because you have a big heart, Jill, because you have a big heart, because you have a big heart, what happens now is you take them back wholeheartedly. Who am I talking to? No matter what they did, the moment you're ready to forgive, they, get, they come directly back to where they were. You let them all the way back in. Catch them up on what they missed. Then they actions show they really didn't repent. And it puts you in a deeper level of offense. I hope I say this right, Pastor D. And then you make the next person pay for what the last person did. You never really deal with the last person because you love them. And in your soul, you're leaving space for them to come back. So you make the person that there's no tie to pay for it because you want them to feel what you felt. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times, Jesus answered. I tell you, not even seven times, but 77 times. Jesus was communicating several things to Peter. One of those things is that forgiveness often has to be repeated. Did you catch that? Forgiveness often has to be repeated. Okay? I'm going to stop on this so you can play softly. Number one, we don't forgive because of pride. Number two, we don't forgive because we think we've already forgiven. Number three, we don't forgive because we didn't get an apology. Forgiveness is not the result of an apology. It's possible to have one without the other. Xander, my oldest, and it's hard to believe he's going to be 15 in January, right? That's crazy. That's insane. Like, Xander's going to be 15 in January. So, he, Xander, I'm very hard on him now. I got accelerated. So, I, I parent. I think I parent very well. But once you hit certain windows, they get different uh, graces. You get what I'm saying? So Xander, he in go mode now. He get straight. It's intense. It's very intense right now. You know, so Xander calls a lady and says, uh, I, don't, I, don't have my, I don't have my girdle. And the coach said, if I don't have my girdle for football and turn it in, I can't play in the last game. Can you find it? So I get home and Lady and Mason tearing the house up looking for this girdle. I, I'm looking for it. Holy Spirit said, call Xander back. I call Xander back. I said, what you doing? Hey, Dad, I'm up here chilling. We finna eat. I was like, all right. I said, um, did you find your girdle? Uh, no, Mason probably turned it in. I said, are they going to let you play? Oh, yeah, I'm good. So then I just lose it. So why you didn't call you back and tell them you were good? Oh, I said, so mama been at the house tearing this house up, going through all the laundry, because we all at the house thinking you're not going to be able to play in your final eighth grade game. Oh, I would, so I lose it. That's called being responsible. Think about what happened. So I just, I went for it. Called irresponsible. Think about your actions. All she had to do, she had to stop. Yada yada yada. Yada yada yada. Yada yada yada. Then we get in the car after the game, and he said, "Dad, I'm sorry." I said, "I don't want to hear. I'm sorry. Show me." Because most parents know, "I'm sorry" is what I say sometimes. Because I really don't want the whooping. Ain't no whooping attached to it. Ain't no whooping attached to it. Baby boy, I need action. I need action. A day, lady hit me. Hey, what's up? Uh, I'm up here at the school. That everybody talking about going to the Spain Park game. I told them I had to call and ask you first. I said, okay, okay, okay. No, we're not going to go. We got other stuff going, yada, yada, yada. All right, cool, cool, cool. Then I thought, I said, you know, he called. That was a step in the right action. Did you catch what I just said? Forgive. It, 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 see, many of us want our, I'm sorry because of what it means. All right, all right, all right. What they say what you hear, okay? What they said was light. 
I'm sorry. What you heard was, you win. So the reason you want I'm sorry is because that's the final step in the game of the argument that denotes who's the winner and who's the loser. You so busy trying to win, you don't even realize after I'm sorry, you still lose. Because you were more concerned with hearing something, not seeing something. Forgiveness isn't about the person that committed the offense. It's about you making a decision to remain offended. Wow. I want to send you home on this. How can I overcome offense, Pastor Mike? All right. I want to speak by faith that the calling ahead of you is greater than the offense that's behind you. Did you hear what I said? The calling ahead of you is greater than the offense that's behind you. Thankfully, this scripture gives us strategy on quitting offense. Number one, face it. The Bible says, leave your sacrifice at the altar and go to the person. Face it. Somebody say face it. One of the worst things we can do with an offense is ignore it. This is how bitterness, anger, and resentment grows. We can't ignore it. I told you offense happens with those close to you through unmet expectations and unexpressed expectations. Did you catch that? Unexpressed expectations. So, so, so this is strong. I may have offended some people and not even known it. So what happens then? And this is so cold-blooded. That's when you say, Pastor, I just need a second. Not today when I get through preaching because I'm excited and everybody want to bombard me. But you, man, I think about it, you didn't hug me in 20, 2015. No, but what I'm saying is sometimes you just got to, for me, this is cold-blooded, write a letter. Why, Pastor Mike? Because it's impossible for them to interrupt me in the letter. I sit with that letter for a couple days. I make sure I take offensive language out. It's not attacking. We might need to, I taught something at a marriage conference um, the other night on fighting fair, and my subtopic was tearing it out without tearing it up. How do I take out the offense without tearing up the relationship? Number two, I have to forgive it. Look at what it says in verse 24. Go, face it, be reconciled to that person. Jesus teaching us that forgiveness is the only way to overcome offense. He isn't instructing us to resume and repair every damaged relationship in our life. Hear me. Jesus is not instructing us to go and resume and repair every broken relationship in our life. Reconcile is a financial term. In the field of accounting, they call it reconciling the books. It means to compare two sets of records and make sure they are in agreement. Whenever we are struggling to forgive someone else's failures, we should take a moment and compare it with how often God has forgiven ours. Every head bow. If you're watching me today and listening to me today, and Pastor Mike, I have a strong spirit of offense. So I want you to lift your hands right where you are, be it in this room or at home. Because I want to speak by faith. As you lift your hands, you open your spirit. As you lift your hands, you open your spirit. There will be those who come and try to maliciously damage your life and destroy your name and destroy your character. And they just can't stand to see you happy. They want to make you pay for their decisions. There are those who love you, but they just have some unmet expectations or you never properly expressed what you wanted from them. <laughs> they thought they were in a friendship. You were thinking romance or your idea of a wife is not who they are. You never expressed the things you desired. Pride made you feel like it was weak of you to do that. They should just know that's ignorance. Right now in the name of Jesus, I come against the spirit of offense. I ask right now, God, that as I am praying, that they will begin to release that spirit off of them. That they will think on these things, whatsoever is lovely, whatsoever is kind, whatsoever is pure, whatsoever is of good report. I ask in this moment, God, that you will come into our hearts and not if you find anything, when you find it, just take it out. Number one, God, before I attempt to forgive them, help me to forgive me. 
because a lot of my offense is wrapped in personally how I felt about myself. A lot of times I was offended because whether that person know it or not, they affirmed the negative feeling I was trying to fight off. And because of that, God, I began to develop roots in the spirit of offense. But Yahweh, I ask in this moment, Adonai, purge me of, purge us of every area of our life that has become a spiritual glue that holds on to the negative while discarding the positive, that area in my life. This is why the scripture says, forgetting those things that are behind me, I press. In other words, he says, remove the negative, but hold on to the positive so you can stretch forward and not be stuck in the present. God, I ask in this moment that we become better people. I ask God that no one on the other side of this camera or in this room is perfect. But God, we will at least be sincere in our pursuit of what you called us to be. So God, in this moment, we lean heavy on Proverbs 3 that we trust in the Lord with all thine heart and we will lean not in our own understanding because the truth of the matter is I can't understand why this person did us like that. I can't understand how my parent can do so and so. I don't understand how they can say they love me and still hurt me. I don't understand how they could let me go after 20 years. I don't understand how no matter what I do is not good enough. That's why we can't lean not on our own understanding. God, we need you to help us become, help us to grow and do all the things you've called us to be. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on our lives. I speak by faith we are better. We are stronger. We are healthier. We are wiser. We are walking in liberty. For where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Oh, how good and pleasant it is for us to dwell together. The anointing shows up in unity. The favor shows up in unity. The power shows up in unity. God, we'll be careful to give you all the glory, honor, and praise. If you're ready for a fresh start, jump on your feet and give God a hand. Come on, thank God in the comments right there. We love you. Listen, Rock City, I just let go of offense. I want to do this. If you're watching me right now, if you're in the room right now, and you're making a decision to let go of the offense, just type, let go, let go. Look at somebody around you and tell them, let it go, 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 let it go. I believe what God is doing, eyes have not seen it, ears have not heard Rock City. If you want to give your life to Christ, I mean it's from the bottom of my heart. Maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've been watching us for a while and you're just looking for a good church home. I want you to text HOME to 28950, 28950. Maybe, Pastor Mike, I've been wanting to join a good church, but my last church offended me. I don't want you to offend me. Let me make you a promise. You're going to be offended in life. What are you going to do with that offense? If you're feeling your spirit, man, this is home for me. Go ahead and come home. Maybe you haven't been to church in a while virtually because something offended you. Maybe you're offended by the fact that we're not back in person. Maybe you're offended by the fact that, man, pastor's not doing X, Y, Z, or church isn't doing X, Y, Z, and you haven't been watching for the last couple weeks, but today you decide to come back on. Let us tell you right now, we're standing right here. We love you. We thank God for you and all that God is doing in your life. If you're giving today, you know how to give. You can text IROC with the amount you wish to give to 28950. Thank you for being faithful over your giving. I do not choose to offend heaven. And that's something we might need to talk about this week in devotions. And we may have to do some sort of Bible study. And you teach this week, Pastor Darius, because we're so concerned about who offended us that we don't realize sometimes our life offends heaven. That when we don't pray, we offend God. When we don't trust him, we offend God as if he can't do it. When we don't give, we offend him thinking that we should supply the need when God can supply the need. I do not want to be an offense to heaven. And I believe what God has for me, eyes have not seen and ears have not heard. Are you blessed? Are you blessed? I love you. I'm praying for you. Pray for your pastor. Uh, this week, I was called and asked to present an award at the Dove Awards this week. So that's pretty cool, man. I get to walk up there and present an award. Uh, but then we're coming right back here so we can get back on fire for what God is doing. I love you. I'm praying peace and blessings over your life. Father, in the name of Jesus, your will. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. In Jesus' name. 
And everybody said, amen. We'll see you at Devo Energy in the morning. Give God praise.